uh, thank you all for coming and um, uh, thank uh, the organizer uh, for inviting me and organize this beautiful conference it's very nice to be on site again after so much uh, virtuality so well i will speak about uh, classical morse theory i will say something about discrete morse theory and then we will move to finite topological spaces so let me begin i know that a lot of you know uh, uh, much about this subject so let me go fast the idea is that we want to, to understand uh, topological features of a, of a manifold a compact differential manifold by understanding maps from the manifold to the reals completely we want to know how the level sets of uh, this manifold change as we increase this parameter a so the 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 level sets at level a they are the set of points whose f value is less than or equal to a okay and the first example in any textbook about this this uh, subject is the torus so imagine we have this two-dimensional manifold which is lying over the table okay and the map that we take is the height function so for every point we consider the distance from the point to the table okay so what are the the level sets well at level a they are the points whose height is less than or equal to a so if we take a as some value which is uh, smaller than the than the height of the table we will have of course an empty set okay but if we take exactly the the height of the table we will have one point the point of contact of the torus with the table if we move forward we get something which is well it's homotopy equivalent to what we have before is a contractible space uh, is homomorphic to a two-dimensional disk okay if we move and if we pass uh, this point right there which will be a critical point we get something which is topologically different okay it's not homotopy equivalent to the disk anymore now we have a cylinder okay it's s1 times the interval so the the topology the homotopy type has changed and now if we move okay we will have a big interval in which this homotopy type will not change we will have this uh, cylinder for for a big interval of parameters and the idea is that we have okay for the, the map f we have the the gradient okay first we need to, to fix some the manual metric but then this uh, gradient it generates a dynamical system in which well the, the points they move in the direction in which f decreases okay and it is this dynamical system which, which gives the deformation between these level sets that we have here okay so we said that the level set at this height and this height they are homotopy equivalent and in fact there is a strong deformation retract which is given by following the flow okay of this this the integral curves of the, the grade cool so uh, this will happen as long as the, the homotopy type will not change as long as we don't cross this what we call critical points so which is what is a critical point they are the point of equilibrium of this dynamical system so uh, it's where the, the the gradient vanishes if you have a local coordinate uh, system this is where the derivatives are trivial okay so in this example we have four critical points okay and for the the results that, that we will mention we need that these critical points they are non-degenerate that means that the matrix the square matrix of second derivatives is uh, non-singular it is inverted okay uh, that is the definition of a morse function so we require the critical points to satisfy this uh, in particular the critical points will be isolated and so we will have finitely many okay in this example we have only four uh, the index of a critical point is the, is the number of directions in which f decreases okay or more precisely is the maximum dimension of a, a subspace of the tangent space in which f decreases so for instance here in this critical point uh, the index is one because there is only one direction in which f decreases okay uh, here we will also have index one in one direction it decreases the other is increases here we have a, a maximum so in both directions we have a, the, the map decreases so the index is two and in the minimum the index is zero okay so uh, one of the we have understood already that the the homotopy type of the level set doesn't change as long as we don't cross a critical value so the, the image of a of 
a, a critical a critical point. But what happens when we cross a critical value? Okay, so in this example here, we began with this uh, disk, and after crossing this height here, we have a cylinder. So how can we understand this change in the homotopy type? Well, it turns out that if the index of this unique critical point that we traverse uh, is the, the index is k, then we can attach a cell of dimension k to the, the small level set to obtain a strong deformation refract of the big one. Okay, so in this case, this basket here is a strong deformation refract of this, this cylinder. So now that we understood how the, the homotopy type changed at the leasing part when we cross a critical value, and that the, the homotopy type does not change when we don't cross a critical value, we have this the one of the main uh, theorems in, in this first part of Morse theory that says that the manifold is homotopy equivalent to a CW complex, which has a k-dimensional cell for each critical point of index k. Okay, so in this particular example, since we have these four critical points and we know the indices, this manifold will be homotopy equivalent to a CW complex with four cells, one of dimension zero, two of dimension one, and one of dimension two. Okay, yes, of course. The, the usual CW structure of the torus has this number of cells. Okay, so in this particular case, the, the this CW complex and the manifold, they are homeomorphic. In general, they will only be homotopy equivalent. Okay, and the result doesn't say exactly what the homotopy type is. It only says what are the cells, okay, the numbers of cells of, of each dimension. In particular cases, we will be able to, to understand completely the homotopy type, but not each other. Okay, so there is a second result, uh, which is <laughs> this Morse inequalities. Uh, so with alpha k is the number of critical points of index k, uh, then we have this inequality for every k between zero and the dimension of the manifold that says that the, this alternating sum is greater than or equal than this than the same alternate sum of the Betty numbers of the manifold. So here we have again some partial information about the homology groups, okay, the, the rational homology groups. So one result says something about homotopy and the other something about homology. Okay, so <coughs> applications of Morse theory, there are a lot inside differential topology for sure, but also in physics and other sciences. So this was just to, to give you a brief picture of this topic. What is discrete Morse theory? Well, it is a combinatorial analog of the classical theory. Uh, it is not the first uh, version, the first combinatorial version of the, the classical theory that appeared, because already Besbin and Brady, they had defined a couple of years before, also in the 90s, a, a PL version of the, the classical Morse theory, which in fact it contains Forman's theory as a particular case. But the big advantage of a Forman's theory is that it is very simple to study, very simple to use, and so there are many applications. So what is discrete Morse theory all about? Uh, we are not working with a manifold anymore. What we have is a finite simplicial complex, okay? It doesn't need to triangulate a manifold, it could be anything. And what is a Morse function in this context? Well, it will be <coughs> a map from the set of simplices of K to the real, okay? Which is almost strictly increasing. Okay, in each simplex. Well, what does it mean? If we have a simplex and we have a phase, then the value of f here should be strictly smaller than the value of f here. This could fail, but only for one phase. Okay, and in the other direction, if we have a co-phase, then the value of f here should be strictly bigger than the value here, and this could fail, but just for one co-phase. Okay, so these numbers here, they should be smaller than or equal to one. <laughs> and this is an example. Okay, so we have the, the value that F takes in, in every simplex. So you see, this really is, is, we have combinatorial information. This map F takes only finitely many values. And you can check, we should check in every simplex that this condition holds. So for instance, this one simplex here, its value phi is smaller, strictly smaller than the value in both cofaces. In this phase here, this value is strictly smaller, but here we have this failure, okay, of, of uh, this strict monotonicity. 
So we have that uh, this number here is one, while the other is zero. Okay. So after checking in every symbol, we know that this is a discrete Morse function. And the definition of critical simplex here is that both numbers are zero. Okay, so really the map is strictly increasing in that simplex. So in this example, example, we have only two critical cells, one of dimension zero, the other of dimension one. Okay. So what is the notion of index here? We are trying to translate every concept that we have in the classical setting to this combinatorial setting. So the index is much simpler to, to define. It's just the dimension of the thing. So we have the index zero here and index one there. <laughs> and again, we have the same theorem that we have for the classical theory. So the complex is homotopy equivalent to CW complex with a K cell for each critical cell, a critical simplex of index K. In this particular case, so we have that the complex will be homotopy equivalent to a CW complex with one, one zero cell and one one dimensional cell. So there is only one possibility here. I mean, the homotopy type is completely determined, is the one of S1. Okay. <coughs> Good. And there is a same a version of the, the same result, most inequalities. So we have exactly the same most inequalities that we have before. So as you see, the the results are very simple, are really easy to use in concrete examples. It's very easy to define, given a simplicial complex, some, some discrete mode function. And you will have, again, some partial information about the, the homotopy type and the merge groups. So there are many applications of these results. Uh, <coughs> there are many inside topological combinatorics. So the idea is that they begin with some combinatorial setting or have some, some game. For instance, they say, okay, let's take a chessboard and we will define a simplicial complex from this chessboard with which the vertices, they are the squares of the board and the simplices, they are set of squares which are pairways in different columns and rows. So they are positions in which you can put a root, a chess, a root, in which in such a way that there are pairways, they are not attacking each other. And this is just one definition of a simplicial complex as natural as any other that you can imagine. And they ask, okay, what is the homotopy type of this complex here? And what they do in many examples, they construct a concrete Morse function or something slightly similar, which is the notion of an acyclic matching. <coughs> uh, and they prove that there exists a unique cell like here of index zero, and then they will have many cells of index n, and that's it. So here again, the homotopy type is completely determined because if you have a CW complex with one zero cell and many cells of dimension n, you have to attach all of them to this point here, so you will have a wedge of n dimensions here. So there are many examples of this type. Okay, the proof they are always very similar, but in general, uh, you will have an application in mathematics and also other sciences. So every time you can use simplicial complexes to model <coughs> something and the uh, homotopy information gives relevant information about the problem you want to solve, then discrete more theory could be used. Okay, so this is just uh, the basics of this theory. <coughs> we said that these numbers, they have to be smaller than or equal to one. Okay, this is the definition of discrete mode function. And it can be proved that they cannot be one both at the same time. Okay, if both there, uh, would be one, there will be a, a problem with another simple. Okay, so if one of these is one, then it has to be zero. And also, if you if you have two simplices, one in face of the other, such that the value here is uh, bigger than or equal to the value there, then these two simplices have to have a consecutive dimensions. Okay, Th this will be a phase of co-dimension one. You cannot have the problem with simplices which are farther. Okay. So what I'm saying is essentially that we have a partition of the set of simplices in singletons, which are the critical cells, and in doubletons, this, this uh, set of cardinality two, which consists of this failure of the, this strict monotonicity. So we will have pairs of simplices, one a phase of co-dimension one of the other, and such that the value of f here is greater than or equal to the value of f. Okay? So we have this, this decomposition, this partition, and 
uh, we will understand with an arrow. So every time we have a failure, a failure like this, we will put an arrow from the lower dimensional simplex to the big one. Okay. And the notion of gradient vector field <coughs> that we are trying to imitate again from the, the classical theory is just a map that maps the tail of an arrow to the, the head, and every critical simplex is fixed. So this is the, the definition of this map gradient vector field. <coughs> and in general, we will forget about the, the Morse function. What we care is just the gradient vector field. This is what has all the information that we need. Okay, about the map, and just as in the classical theory, if you remember the, the gradient uh, vector field gave the, this deformation between different level sets. So here, the the gradient vector field will also give information about deformations in our context. Concretely, I'm speaking about uh, simplicial collapses, white uh, homotopy theory. So, for instance, this arrow here says that we can the formation refract this triangle into this the union of the other one synthesis, okay? these two phases. So really, there is a formation refract. Now we can collapse this one simplex here to obtain something from of equivalent. We can continue in this way. <coughs> now, when I try to collapse this, this is not a simplicial collapse. It's what we call an internal collapse, okay? But when we collapse this, we have something from of equivalent. And now the, this one simplex is not a simplex anymore. It's a, it's a one-dimensional cell, which is attached in this way. So we don't have a simplicial complex anymore, but this is a CLU complex. And when we collapse this one cell here, well, now the, this one cell is attached with the attaching map, which is constant, OK? Both boundaries are, the, the boundary is attached to a unique form. And we can continue like this. We can collapse this thing. Then we can collapse this triangle here, there. And we'll, what we get is this CW complex, uh, the, the, the theorem says that was homotopy equivalent to the equivalent to the, the original complex. So, <coughs> what is a gradient path here? We are trying to copy the idea of the trajectories that we have in the classical case. So, a gradient path is a, a sequence of simplices. This symbol here means that this is a, a phase of four dimension one. Okay, and every time that we go up, we assume that we are going through an arrow of this gradient vector field, and every time we go down, we go to a simplex which is different from the previous one. Okay, so this is the notion of gradient path. So let's go to an example to understand the, the definition. This is the I'm not putting Morse functions anymore, so this is the, the gradient vector field of some Morse function. And what is a, a gradient path here? Well, for instance this orange one, okay? We begin with this cell here, we go up using the arrow, then we go to a face, which is different from the previous one. Then we take again an arrow, face, arrow, face, arrow, and let's say we finish here. So this is a gradient path. But there's another one, which is this one here, okay? So we have this interesting thing in contrast to the classical case in which a point uniquely determines the trajectory, okay? Of the, the flow through that, that point. Here we could have different gradient paths through the same symbol. Okay, so here this is something different. Uh, I will come back to this. Let me mention one last result, <coughs> which in fact should come before the Morse inequalities. So the, the notion of Morse complex, this is a, a, a chain complex. It exists only in, at an algebraic level. So in degree P, it has the free abelian group generated by the P dimensional critical cells, the cells of index uh, P. And so what is the, the boundary? Okay, so from degree P, P plus one to degree P, well, it takes one simplex critical of index P plus one and returns a linear combination of critical simplices of index P. So what is the this coordinate of this simplex tau? Well, it's a sum. <laughs> of numbers, each of which is equal to plus one or minus one. And the sum is made over all the possible uh, gradient paths from a phase of co-dimension one of sigma to tau. And I will say something about, okay, when this is one and when this is minus one, let's go to an example and the definition will be clear. So this is a, a triangulation of the real projective plane 
again, we have a, some, some a, the, the gradient vector field of some discrete Morse function. There are only three critical cells. One is this sigma of dimension two, tau of dimension one, and there is only one cell of a critical of dimension zero, which is this D. Okay, so the Morse complex will have a copy of C in each degree, zero, one, and two. And I want to understand what are these, uh, these boundary maps. So the boundary map in degree two, we have to consider <coughs> all the possible gradient paths from a phase of sigma to tau. So there is one here, and there is another one there. There are only two. Okay, and what are these numbers? Plus one, minus one. Well, if we choose an orientation for sigma and an orientation for tau, then sigma, this orientation, induces through this path orientations in all the one simplices and two simplices that we have in, in the path. And if the orientation induced by sigma on tau is the one that we chose at the beginning, then we will put a plus one. If it is the opposite orientation, we'll put a minus one. It turns out in this example that the orientations induced by sigma on tau in both gradient paths are exactly the same. So depending on what the what orientation we chose for, for tau, we are adding two times the number plus one or two times the number minus one. So this map here is multiplication by two or minus. And this map here, well, we have to, again, <laughs> consider from the faces of tau, all the gradient paths to B. So one is the zero length path, just B. And the other is this path here that goes from A <coughs> to B. And you can check that the orientations induced by tau on B, they are different, they are opposite here. And this is why we are adding a plus one and minus one, and we get the zero. So the homology in this case of the, the Morse complex well, it has a, a copy of C2 in, in degree one. So this is the homology of the real projective plane. And this is the general case, okay? The, so this is the result. The homology of the Morse complex is the same as the, homolo the homology of the original simplicity complex, okay? So, and from this is that we can deduce this Morse inequality, okay? With the Betty number of perturbations map. Good. <coughs> so the last thing I will say about uh, about this part of discrete Morse theory. So this is the definition that Thomas will need for, for this talk. So it's the, the general notion of vector field, okay? Not just a gradient vector field, but in general, what is a, a vector field on, on, on K? Well, essentially it's, again, a partition of the set of simplices in singletons and double tones, which in the double tones, again, they are a simplex and a phase of co-dimension one. Okay, so this definition is more general than the notion of, of gradient because uh, the, when we have a gradient, so if you see a, a gradient path, the values of f will always decrease, okay? Because here we have that the value here, since we have a narrow in the gradient uh, vector field, the value here is smaller than or equal, and then here it is strictly smaller. So we will not have closed gradient paths, okay? We have no side. In this example, while in the general case we could have cycles. So this is this is the difference. So this is something more general. And <clears throat> let me conclude this this part of the talk with some problems. <clears throat> so the idea is that we, we want to have a dynamical system now on the set of, of simplices of K in such a way that these gradient paths they are the trajectories of this dynamical system, trying to copy what we have for the the classical theory. Okay, so in the original setting, we were working with continuous time dynamical systems. So the, the time was the real. Well, here, well, we are uh, we are in a in a finite set. So in general, it doesn't make sense to consider a continuous time dynamical system. I, here, I don't care about the topology. In a finite set, this will always be, be trivial. The, the orbits will be, will be constant. So we have to move to discrete times. You know, the time with the, the integers or some subset of the integers. Okay, so I'm speaking about just one map from the set of simplices to itself. And we want to understand what happens when we iterate this map. Okay, do we have, a, for sure, we'll have some, some periodic orbits, we will have a, attractors, repellers, or what kind? 
what, what uh, the usual features that we can study when we have a, a discrete dynamic system. But the second <coughs> problem is this uh, this thing that we have that there could be different paths through the <coughs> same symbols. Okay, so in general, we cannot expect that uh, the gradient paths they are trajectories of uh, this. The, the, the map that generates our dynamical system because we will have bifurcations. So to overcome that, we are going to move, we, are, we will abandon the idea of a single value map and we will work with multi value maps. So every simplex will be mapped to a set of simplices. And in this way, we will have solutions okay, of this uh, new multi value uh, dynamical system. Okay, and we have more hope to, to find. Uh, solutions which are the, the trajectories of this uh, gradient, uh, this this gradient path. And the last part. Excuse me. Is this map D also objection? This uh, this map here. No, D. 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 <laughs> uh, the capital I, D. I believe it's no. Top. Yes, this one here. Uh, if it's a bisection. <coughs> Uh, I believe it. I believe it is no. So the things in the intersection they so are fixed. It's one to one, but the, the domain is not the whole uh, case. So this is why it's better to speak about this partition because. Yeah, in general we understand this with with the partition. So it's one to one, but in general it's not subjective. Okay. Sorry. Uh, it's one to one, but not. One to one from domain to image. So the domain is just the whole space, the image is not the whole space, but you, when you take the domain and the image, then it's one to one. And so, okay, so, the, so how is this different from just the matching? No, there is just the matching. It's just match, match, match. Match. That's, yes. that's just the matching, yes. Okay, so, so, so it's a set of this first general matching. Is it just yes. is it just the, is it just the same as the matching? Yes, exactly. This at this stage is exactly the same as the matching. Yes. So the last part is we don't want to have just combinatorics. So if we want to study dynamics, we want this phase space to have some topology. Okay, to really use topological uh, arguments and, and topological tools. So what is an interesting topology that we can put to this set here? If we take a metric topology in a finite set, this will be discrete. So this is not interesting. We are, again, in the combinatorial setting. So what is an interesting topology that we can put here? And this is how the, the last part of the talk begins. So what is an interesting topology in a finite set? So if we have <coughs> A finite simplicial complex, which we can consider the, the phase poset. So it is the poset of simplices which are ordered by the inclusion. Okay, so here, this one here represents this two dimensional simplex. These three points, they are the one dimensional phases. The minimal points of this poset, they are the, the vertices of the complex. This is the, the Hastayet diagram. So we put one point below the other if this one is smaller and there is nothing in the middle. Okay. The usual way to, to represent the poset with a directive graph. <coughs> and we are going to put a topology to the underlying set of this poset. So the open sets, they will be the down sets. So they are uh, subsets which are closed by taking smaller elements. So if something is there and there is a smaller point that will also be there. Okay, so this is an example, it's this set of orange points. <coughs> okay. And if we have a union of down sets, then this is again a down set, and the section of down sets is a down set. So this really is a topology, and this is the topology that we will consider. It is true that in when you study dynamics, it is more useful and more natural to use the opposite convention that the open sets they are the upset. Okay. Uh, in, in the, the for me, what is the standard definition? That one here. This is the one that I will use today, but. Thomas will use the opposite. Uh, so uh, in our example, when the poset comes 
from the complex, uh, the open sets, they are the subcomplexes, which are closed in general. So it makes sense to consider the subcomplexes as closed subspaces in the finite space. But we have these two conventions. Again, I will stick to this one. Okay. <coughs> so uh, in more generality, I don't need to this poster to come from a, a simplicial complex. So if I have any any finite poster, we can define a topology using as open set this down set. So this is always a topology. So we have this first uh, assignation to every poster. We associate a finite topology space, <laughs> and this. These finite spaces, they are zero. This is the lowest action of separation. So recall every time that we have two different points, there should exist an open set containing only one of them. And why is this topology always T zero? Well, if we have two different points, then one of them cannot be smaller than the other, okay, for, for one in one direction. One is not smaller than the other. So if you take the downset generated by this point here, I mean all the points which are smaller than or equal to this one. This will be an open set containing one and not the other. Okay, so this is the, the unique axiom of separation that we will consider when working with finite spaces. Because if you have a house of space which is finite, already the, it will be discrete, even if it's T1, because T1 means that the points are closed. So every subset is a union of finitely many points, so everything will be closed. That is not interesting. Okay, uh, this, <laughs> this peculiarity of finite spaces. That they are not housed of in general will have uh, interesting implications when we study dynamics of finite spaces. Cool. So we have this first uh, this first application here, this map. Let's go in the other direction. So if we have now a finite T0 space, <coughs> we will consider for every point the minimal open set, which is the intersection of all the open sets containing X. Okay, this is again open because it's an intersection of finitely many open sets and in fact this is the smallest open set containing x because it's containing n okay so we define a, a relation in the underlying set of x one point is smaller than the other if the first one is contained in the minimal open set of the set well i claim that this relation is a partial order so it is transitive it's reflexive and you can check it's anti-symmetric because of this T0 axiom. So let's try to understand this relation in a particular example. So this is a finite space. It has only four points. And the open sets, they are given by these closed curves here. So what is the, the minimal open set of B? It is the smallest open set containing B. So it's the set BC. So C is contained there. It means that C is smaller than B. Okay, the minimal open set of A is everything. So A will be a maximum here. Okay. And so D has to be smaller. And you can check that D and B, C, they are comparable. In fact, in this particular example, there are uh, open sets separating D from B, which are disjoint. Something is stronger than what we re require. So this is the poset associated to this topology. And this is the basic correspondence. So these two applications from finite posets to finite zero spaces and in the other direction, one is the inverse of the other. Okay, so this is this correspondence was found by Alexandrov in the 30s. It is very old, and this is why for us it's the same finite posets and finite zero spaces. And this correspondence is so good that it behaves well also at the level of morphisms. I mean, if we have a map between finite zero spaces, then it is continuous if and only if it is order preserved. Okay, it's a poset map in the sense that it maps. Uh, comparable points to comparable points in the, the same direction. So <clears throat> let me try to give you uh, an idea of the proof just for you to have a, a taste of what finite spaces are. So suppose that we have x smaller than or equal to x prime. So we want to prove that f of x is smaller than or equal to f of x prime. We're assuming that f is continuous. So the minimal open set of f x prime is an open set. And the pre image under the continuous map has to be also open. And also, x prime, of course, is contained here because f of x prime is contained in its minimal open set. But this is the smallest open set containing x prime. And that is why we have this inclusion. But now we are assuming that x is smaller than x prime. So, by definition, this means that x is contained here. 
So we have that X is contained in this free image. So F of X is contained here, which by definition means that F of X is more than or equal to F of X. So this is a proof of the first implication. The second implication, you can do it. It's, it's the same kind of argument. Okay? And you can try really to play with these definitions. So <laughs> we have this first result. Let me say just a couple of uh, definitions that, that Thomas will need. So we said already that closed sets, they are the, the complement of open, so they are upset in our, our convention. And <laughs> what is uh, well, locally closed, this is a general definition in any topological space, a subset is locally closed if it's an intersection of an open set and a closed set. But in the particular case of <laughs> finite spaces, well, we are intersecting, intersecting a down set with an up set. So this is an interval. So if you want a convex subset of the order, I mean, if we have two different points in the in this, this set, and there is a third point which is bigger than one and smaller than the other, it will also be there. Okay. Sorry. Several intervals. Uh, yes, for me, several intervals. It's exactly this, this, the notion of complexity that you were saying. What do you mean by several intervals? Okay, this was what we were discussing. For me, an interval is if you have two things in the interval and something in the middle, it will also be the interval. And this is okay, but this is what you call complexity. Okay, so if you want, take the notion of complexity. But this is what I use. If we have two things in the set, anything which is more than one and bigger than the other should also be there. <coughs> Good. So this is not the same as a union of intervals. Okay. Convex. Convex. Good. <coughs> so uh, again, a general notion for, for topological spaces. <clears throat> so this is something smaller than the boundary. If you have a, a subset of X, then the mouth is the closure minus the set A. And there is this uh, result that A is locally closed if and only the mouth is closed. Again, this is something general, but Thomas will, will use it for finite spaces. And let's move on then to connectivity. So we understood something about finite spaces. We have this correspondence. And we, we understand how we must uh, behave with respect to, to this, this combinatorial analog and process. But <laughs> what happens with connectivity? I mean, if we have a finite space, which is not just a point, can it be connected? Okay. And the answer is, well, yes. If we have, for instance, this the, the Sospinsky space, so this is the two points point space, uh, which is not discrete or undiscrete. So we have one point smaller than the other. So B is the, the unique proper open set here. And I claim that this space is path connected because we have this uh, path that it stays in B all the time. And at the last moment, it jumps to A. So this looks like this is not continuous, but it is. How do I check that this map is <laughs> continuous? Well, we have to prove that the pre image of every open set is open. And there are very few open sets here. So the pre image of the empty set and everything, of course, is open. The pre image of B is this interval 0, 1, which is open. So this is a continuous. Okay. So, in particular, if we have a pose of the finite space in which the Hasse diagram is connected as an undirected graph, I mean that we can go from any point to another just by considering a fence going up and down in the Hasse diagram, <coughs> then we can concatenate this path that we just define and the inverse is to have a path from here to here. So if the Hasse diagram is connected as a graph and directed graph, then the space is path connected. And in fact, the converse holds. <coughs> so if we have a space which is a path connected or connected, which is the same for finite spaces, then the Hasse diagram will be connected. Okay, this implication is, is easier than the, the one that we just, just proved. So we understood when finite spaces are connected, we can really see this in, in the Hasse diagram. But for me, this result is important because of the following. Okay, there is a description of homotopies. So if we have two maps between finite spaces 
then they will be homotopic. I mean, homotopic is the usual definition of homotopic, okay, with a, a homotopy that goes from the cylinder of X to, to Y, which begins in F and finishes in G. And there is such a, a homotopy if and only if there is a sequence of continuous maps from F to G in which any two consecutive they are comparable. And by comparable, I mean with the pointwise ordering. So every time we evaluate in a point in the domain, we have the same point. So <clears throat> this is, in fact, an order in the mapping space of maps from X to Y. So we have this, this description, combinatorial description of homotopies. And again, let me give you an idea of the proof. So there exists a homotopy from F to G, if and only if there is a path in the mapping space from F to G. Here, what we are using is the classical exponential law that allows us to jump, to make this x jump from the product to the exponent here. Okay? Perhaps you are more used to use the exponential law with a, a locally compact and household space. Finite spaces are not household in general, but still, <laughs> there is a more general version of the exponential law in which you only require that every point has a basis of compact neighborhood and that you always have it for finite spaces. So we can use the exponential law. And then I claim that this space, that of course we are, we are considering the compact open topology, because we are using the exponential law, <coughs> is a finite space with a topology. It's just an as associated order. And this order is exactly this pointwise order that we just defined. So when do we have a path from two points in this space? Well, when the Hasse diagram corresponding to this poset here is connected. I mean, we can go from one point to the other with a fence. So we, there must be a fence of map using this pointwise order. So we just use the exponential law and the fact that the compact open topology corresponds to this natural order in the set of maps. Okay, so this is the proof. So we have a combinatorial description of homotopies. And the most interesting application, I don't have much more time, so uh, I will say this very fast. Uh, but for me, this is one of the most interesting results of the theory of finite spaces, proved by Bob Stone in the 60s. He proved that there is an algorithm which decides, even two finite spaces, whether they are homotopy equivalent or not. This is something super strong. So in the case of even finite sequential complexes that they are defined with finite information, they are, they are really combinatorial, there is no such an algorithm. There you have the world problem that says that you cannot decide homotopy equivalence in this, this case. But for finite spaces, you can do it. And the way Stone do it is, uh, does it is for uh, using this, this combinatorial description of homotopy. Completely, he defines a class of points, which he calls big points, and proves that two finite spaces are homotopy equivalent if and only you can get one from the other just by adding and removing this particular kind of points. And moreover, this is this is algorithmic. Okay, there is there is control in the, the, the number of points that you remove for that. Yes. What do you mean by setting of equivalence to two patterns on the finite uh, space? Sorry, the, the, there is an algorithm. Where if you the input is two finite spaces, so you give me two posets, and the algorithm decides whether they are homotopy equivalent. Okay, whether there is a homotopy equivalence from one to the other. Okay. I would have loved to, to speak more about this this algorithm. Very interesting. Yeah, for that. What kind of Yes, yes, I really yeah. Really, you have to detect the, this kind of points, which is really easy in the, in the space. You just remove this big point and you get something which doesn't have big points anymore. Okay? And then you do the same with the other space. And what you have at the end, they have to be homeomorphic. Okay, so probably this is the part that takes more time. No, yeah, the like common part. Yeah. <laughs> First, we have to define there is such a notion. But what do you mean here by simple homotopy? They are finite spaces. 
So the, the usual notion of simple models is that even the points. Yes, yes, you're right. I didn't say that, but correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you move to the, the order complexes, uh, they are different notions homotopy and simple homotopy. And yes, the, these big points, they give you simple homotopy. Uh, but in fact, there is something in the middle. Okay, so this is something stronger than having simple homotopy. So there could be simple homotopy and still they would not be homotopy as finite spaces. So, uh, just to finish, let me say that everything that we have just considered lies, uh, except from the, the last comment, lies in the world of finite spaces. Okay, so we we haven't seen any finite space which has I know non-trivial fundamental groups, non-trivial homology groups. Okay, perhaps we will have a lot of examples which are not homotopy equivalent, but it could still be possible that all the homology invariants that we know, they are all true. Okay. So how can we understand this usual homology and all these invariants? Well, the construction that we mentioned at the beginning, <coughs> that for every complex, you have the, the phase poset, and this is a finite space. So this is a, a metric space, the geometric realization. This is not even causal. In general, they will not be homotopy equivalent, okay? but they are weak homotopy equivalent. So McCord proved in the same year, in the 66, that there exists a map from here to here, which is a weak homotopy equivalent. It induces isomorphisms in homotopy groups and therefore also in homology and conversion groups. So just as an example, if we take the boundary of the two simples, so this empty triangle here, then the, the phase poset is this six point space and this result says that the fundamental group of this space is C. Okay, it's not really it's the fundamental group of the of S1. Okay. <clears throat> so really every homotopy invariant, I mean these homology groups, homotopy groups, homology stay there, that you can encounter in the world of finite CW complexes or simplicial complexes will appear also in the realm of finite spaces. So you have all those those wild examples here, and in the other the other direction, if you have finite in space, then the order complex <coughs> is the the simplicial complex of change of totally ordered subsets of X. So, for instance, if we have this finite space, A B C is a chain, so this will be a two-dimensional simplex in the order complex. A B D is another chain, D E is another. So this is the order complex of such a finite space, and again, McCor proves that in fact there are two versions of the same result that this metric space and this finite space are weak homotopy equivalents. So they have the same homotopy invariant. So everything that you have in one uh, one world, you have it in the other. So really, finite spaces can be used to study serial complexes. Okay. So what I just said is much more than that we require yet for, for the part of a dynamical system. Uh, but I wanted to give you just uh, an idea of what finite spaces are and why they are interesting also <laughs> from the, the point of view of uh, homotopy theories. So I hope I convince you that they are interesting and, and useful. But that's what I wanted to say. Delayed, but if there are any questions, any more questions, because we already have some. If not, then maybe let's go to the second part of the talk and then we have more time for questions. <coughs>